Right. Good, e good evening, everyone. If there are any of the registrars in the department, we'd love to see you up here in level five. Yogesh and, here, Yogesh and I are here on our own. We're feeling a bit lonesome. <laughs> We're delighted to see so many people online. That's fantastic. Uh, but it would be great if people are in the department to come and join us because it does make a more pleasant, good evening, a more pleasant atmosphere uh, for Yogesh. Um, anyway, thank Yogesh, thank you so much for, for coming and doing this. Uh, Yogesh has been instrumental um, in developing pl or planning developing, leading the, the thrombectomy service, which we've got up and running, which is fantastic, um, and expanding it mm. as we recruit more staff and developing this regional um, network for thrombectomy. So I think it's fantastic news for patients. Good evening, welcome. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Did you hear my plea? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so much nicer to lecture to a room full of people rather than these empty seats. Yeah. I just feel when Yogesh has put so much time and effort into preparing something. So anyway, I want to hand over to Yogesh, um, who needs no further introduction. He is a star member in our department, working extremely hard and very effectively. So Yogesh, thank you so much for coming and sharing that with us, uh, the Thrombectomy Service. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye. So um, thank you, Fiona, for that very kind introduction. Um, welcome to you all. Thank you for coming. Um, thank you for the kind invitation to speak, something that's a, a very close topic um, to mine and all neurointerventionists' heart, um, hearts. Um, you will have noticed there's some building work going on, um, and people have had to move their offices, and people have had to change the way they come into the office, and all that's because of us. Um, we, we, we fully take the blame and hopefully I can explain to you the uh, importance of what we're doing and the reason for what we're doing. Um, and you will understand and uh, sympathize with what, we've, uh, uh, what, we're, what we're doing. So when I finished medical school and became a junior doctor, um, there wasn't actually a treatment for stroke. There was actually in theory, but not one that was being applied. So people used to come in with their stroke and we would put them in bed and we would document their disabilities. And then if they survived, we would then um, do, you know, they would have therapies. So physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech and language therapy. That was all stroke treatment was about. It was about kind of trying to get people back some function. But there was nothing we could do medically to the brain. And then in 1995, um, so I did qualify after 1995, but it hadn't come into practice. In 1995, there was a, a, a landmark trial which said that if you give IV thrombolysis to someone who's having a stroke, in a certain criteria, you couldn't do give it to a, you have to give it in the first three hours. And we had to um, do a plain CT head, make sure there was no bleeding or a tumor or any kind of stroke mimic. If you could do that, then you could improve their outcomes. And there was very little progress after that. Um, about 13 years later, there was a further trial came out that said, if you can give it up to four and a half hours, um, but that was it. It wasn't really um, something that was groundbreaking. You, you've increased the time window for an IV thrombolysis. And they were getting good results. Um, this is, this is um, these two bars, this lighter one is the people benefiting from thrombolysis and the darker one is people who are being harmed by thrombolysis. And clearly in the first 90 minutes, a lot more people are benefiting. The second 90 minutes, less are being benefited, but still a large number, less in the next 90 minutes. And then after four and a half hours, the balance shifted. So more people being harmed by thrombolysis than were being benefited. So at that point, people stopped giving thrombolysis. And that's where we were with, with uh, stroke treatment. We had a, a four and a half hour window. We had an injection to give. We had a bit of imaging to do. And, uh, but, but we had a treatment. So it was really um, quite good. But as a neurointerventionist, we were always keen to say, could we open up these arteries? And we had some experience of opening up arteries um, in certain situations where patient, patients have presented. And we knew it was a good thing but we didn't have evidence. And because we didn't have evidence, we never could get the, all of the backing to provide thrombectomy. 
there was actually many attempts at thrombectomy. And the, 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 the last one before everything came out okay was in 2013, where the, the result was that mechanical thrombectomy is futile for acute stroke. We look at that study now and we laugh, but it was uh, you know, uh, 10 years ago, so not, not that long ago, um, there was the trial was really poorly organized. It took 10 years to recruit patients. People were doing thrombectomies in situations where we wouldn't do thrombectomy. The devices they had were really poor and it was futile in those circumstances. So what happens if you get a, a trial like this? Um, you do another one and you keep doing it until you get to the, the right answer. So we did another trial and the first one that was positive was this MR clean trial in 2015. It was a Dutch trial and it was strict. It was, you know, you weren't paid to do a thrombectomy you were, yeah, and you were only paid if the thrombectomy was done in the context of a trial. So, you, so everyone that needed a thrombectomy in, in, in Holland had to have, um, have to be registered for a trial, had to be randomized into the treatment arm and they did it. And you had to do it within six hours. You had to be qualified, trained, um, and they showed that thrombectomy significantly improves outcomes and the significantly is important I'll show you uh, in the in the next trial in the next uh, slide um, and as soon as that trial reported there was other trials that were ongoing all of them stopped did the interim analysis and all of them showed the positive effects of thrombectomy so 2015 was quite a landmark year for us and it showed that we could improve outcomes up to 12 hours the best evidence really was six hours and that's kind of where we're um, stuck at the moment um, <clears throat> although I'll show you this, there's, there's, there's um, much more um, time window here. And that's where everyone is within six hours, you come in with a stroke, um, you have a large, large artery occlusion, you can really improve the outcome. And it followed very quickly in the next year, a few months later, actually, with a nice guidance saying thrombectomy should be provided for stroke. And then, of course, the next thing that happens after nice guidelines is nice commissioning or, or NHS commissioning. And that, of course, takes its own time. And we're still in that kind of process in trying to deliver those services. The outcome data that we, we saw, um, so the MR Clean was the one that managed to um, uh, finish their trial. So they had a nice round number. Um, and what they showed was the, the, the important thing is the, these two numbers here, the, the medical arm and the endovascular arm. So these are the ones who had standard treatment. And these are the ones who were selected similarly to the ones that the other ones were and therefore they but had thrombectomy in addition. So the figures are a little bit unusual that some of the medical arm do better than the thrombectomy arm in other trials, but it's all about patient selection. So if you highly select patients and you have them say, we only want to do them within four and a half hours, then more of them will do well, even with medical treatment, but um, the overall treatment effect will be of the number of patients you're treating will be less. So even so, this it, it's the difference between these that's the important thing. So in this trial, the MR clean will have relatively relaxed um, entry criteria, will recruit many more people, and will cause that much more benefit as well. And so all of these trials show the same thing. There was you know, six, seventy, eighty percent um, of people were becoming independent who would otherwise not be independent after treatment. So it was a really um, important um, moment for us. So just to say, just to come step back a little bit and say, so what do we do for thrombectomy? What do we need to do? So patient comes in with a stroke. We have to recognize it's an acute stroke. We rush them into the CT scanner and we scan their brain. And that's what we do for IV thrombolysis. We look and we're looking really, you know, is it a bleed? Because about 5, 10, 15% can be bleeds. It can be a mimic of a stroke. It can be functional. So we're looking to see ideally a normal looking brain. There might seem some very early damage. And on top of that, then we do a bit of additional imaging to say, is the vessel occlusion that we can get to? And that's generally the CT angiogram. Um, we have up our sleeve the CT perfusion as well, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail in a, in a, in a bit. But we look at that imaging and very quickly we make our mind up that do we do a thrombectomy or do we not? And if we do a thrombectomy, pretty much what we'd like to do is from the CT scanner, on level two, just take the lift up to level four and let's go straight in and start doing this thrombectomy. We don't want to spend any time, don't want to waste any time on this, um, on that process. 
we know and this this thing you've heard time is brain you know the, the quicker you do it the, this is this many million 1.7 million neurons 1.9 million neurons per minute are dying and if you can do the treatment quicker then you will you know if you save a minute you'll save what's that's close to two million neurons which seems like a good thing you know you really want to um, uh, protect as many neurons save as many neurons as possible so here's a an example of one case we did a couple of years ago um, people are coming in young um, it's not necessarily just that this stroke is a disease for the older person. Um, this is this, this uh, lady, 51 year old, uh, right handed, normally well, functionally independent, of course, you know, um, so just a typical person with no other medical problems and presented with an acute stroke. So she had a dysarthria, she had left sided sensory inattention, facial weakness and complete loss of power in the left arm and leg. Now, um, her GCS was 15, but agitated and agitated because she realized what's, what's happening to her. She's got a severe disability. And without this treatment, she is going to end, you know, she's going to keep this disability. And there may be some improvement after the acute phase, but this is going to be a bad stroke. So at this moment, you know, we have a we, we can predict if we don't do anything. This is going to be a bad stroke. Um, her blood pressure is normal. And we, OK, so we think she's having a right hemispheric stroke. She may be having a bleed. We need to kind of look at this. So we get, we take her in, we, we do a CT scan. And the CT scan shows us the first sign we're looking at that hyperdense vessel in <laughs> where we expect to see the right MCA. So if you look over um, here, this is, this, is, this is where the circle of Willis will sit. This is where the MCA will, will go out towards the, 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 uh, its branches towards the Sylvian fissure. And there's hyperdensity there. So that hyperdensity is suggesting to us that there's an acute clot. And we need to do something about this. And the brain doesn't look too bad. Looks like it's this. We've got this fairly early. We can do something for this patient. So we do a CT angiogram. With lots of slices in the CT angiogram. We include the neck as well, so we can look at the access to the to the vessels. But showing you the the picture, we can see that there's a cutoff of the MCA. So this is the ICA coming up here. This is the contralateral vessel. Normally, we'd expect it to continue and divide into M2 branches and so on. I know I don't need to tell all of you this, but uh, just, just for, for everyone's sake, here is the occlusion. And you can see there's some collateral filling of vessels. So brain blood vessels, like any other arteries, they do fill backwards. They will fill from their parenchyma. They'll find ways of blood getting round. But what we can see is that there is this occlusion here, and it's associated with a functional deficit that, that, that she's, um, she's presenting with, and a severe functional deficit. The perfusion was done. Um, we, we tend to be quite keen on perfusion. It's not always necessary. And in this case, I think, you know, actually we could miss this step and go straight into to, to treating patients, but just to, it's there so we'll illustrate. And what the perfusion is trying to show us is what, what part of the brain is actually at risk and what's already damaged. Um, I'll go into this in a second. Um, and so what we can see is that there seems to be a mismatch between the core and the penumbra. And if we can see that mismatch, then we know that there's a lot of brain to save here. Now this part of the brain, um, it looks like that's, 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 that's dead, that, that we can't get that back, but that's not necessarily gonna cause a devastating infarct. If the rest of it goes, then it, it is. So we, we look at this and we say, that's a favorable pattern and we should, we, should, you know, we should treat this patient. So we take her into angio, uh, we put a catheter, in, a large catheter into the right ICA, the large so that we can then use it to aspirate uh, thrombus. Um, and we inject contrast, the contrast looks back, black. The importance of this image is that this is exactly what the CTA looked like. So the CTA should be predicting, the, the, the non-invasive imaging should be predicting what the invasive imaging is, is going to show us. That's the whole value of it. So it's showing exactly what we thought, that there is an occlusion of that vessel. Um, we put up devices. Um, this is a large aspiration catheter. We can use a thrombectomy device. We pull that clot out and you can see now there's forward flow. Of all of these branches are now filling that were not filling before. So this is the, a dramatic change uh, from the, uh, in, in the flow in the angiographic appearances to what we could see uh, previously. So we've opened up this vessel um, and uh, we you get a thrombus. We sometimes we used to excitedly take a picture off the thrombus. Nowadays we just throw it away because it's um, it's such a common thing. Um, but you, you get end up with quite a large thrombus. Looking at that, 
you know, that's not going to be lysed by any sort of thrombolytic agent. You know, that's just too much. It's just too much thromb, um, burden of clot there. Most likely in this kind of situation, what's happened is that the clots formed in the heart, sat there for a while, maybe days, and then for some reason it's triggered. It may have, they've been in AF, and then they may have triggered back and got gone back into sinus rhythm, and then that clot shot off into the, into the, into the brain. And so this, this is not necessarily that's something that can be treated by um, IV lytics um, or uh, thrombolytics. So um, clot, we scan her the next day. Um, so the, we concentrate on the radiology initially, and then we'll go into the clinical. And just wanted to show you this picture. This is what, what I told you is what the brain we think is, is going to die, is dead. And this is exactly or very similar to what it looks like 24 hours post-procedure. The, the prediction of the perfusion is there. It really is predicting where the infarct is going to be. So we've used the parameters here to guide us to say this is what's going to infarct. And it has. It's the, 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 the chordate nucleus, the lentiform nucleus, with a bit of swelling, have infarcted. And that was exactly what the imaging predicted. And also, the penumbra that we saw that we thought would become the infarct has not, because we've managed to support the process, stop the process from going any further. You can't reverse the process because death is death, but you, what you can do is you can halt the process continuing any further. So that's what we've uh, managed to do. Um, she actually did very well. Um, her stroke score came down to four. So in general, you have to have a stroke score of about six or above to actually be treated, unless it's something specific. Um, so they say what, what we call a functional disability. Um, she um, initially had a stroke score of 16. Um, she went, she went for, uh, for ongoing rehab. Um, she was independently mobile. She went back to Hinchinbrook, uh, where she was referred from. And three months later, somewhat bizarrely, she was swimming half a mile a day. It's just something that she thought she needed to get fitter and healthier and you know, she'd had a stroke. Um, but just showing that the kind of high functional ability she'd achieved, she was walking independently, returned to driving, essentially back to normal life after um, after this potentially life altering event. So we want to give this service, apply this service to everyone that could have it. Um, but we have a few challenges. Um, um, first of all, the neuro interventionists, they only tend to be in neurosciences units and there's 28 neurosciences units in the UK and we all know each other. Um, and there's about hundred of us trained operators um, and to provide a service for one of the biggest diseases, um, which is the biggest cause of disability, third biggest cause of death, um, with 100 operators, it is a challenge, especially when it's something that has to be done so urgently. It's not something you say, well, I'll come in tomorrow morning and do this stroke. It's, it's something that you have to do in the middle of the night. So there's a lot of challenges in that service delivery. And the other thing is, can we expand the scope of this treatment in terms of, can we expand that time window? Can we treat people with more damaged brain and can we go into even smaller vessels as our technology improves as our materials improve and we can actually do something more than we could do maybe last year or the year before that so what i'm going to do is just cover those two things now in terms of how we first of all how do we do the service provision but then also some work some interesting work in terms of expanding the scope of the treatment in terms of um, patient selection as well so this is us. So we're Cambridge. We are in the middle um, there. The other red crosses are other neurosciences units in this kind of area. It's just a snapshot of the country with obvious um, filters. Um, so in, in London, there's six neuroscience units. Um, the, the Oxford is there, Coventry, Birmingham are there, Nottingham is there, um, Stoke is there. But we're quite isolated out here. The stars here, these are um, services that, that take patients with stroke and thrombolize them. And the other job that they have now is once they've thrombolized someone or once they've decided to thrombolize someone is, is there a large vessel occlusion? Do they need to go for a thrombectomy? And then they would uh, need to send these patients to us. Now, obviously they have to do this in a very prompt manner. The, the CT scans have to be done. The CT angiogram has to be done. A challenge is the CT angiogram has to be reported um, and somebody has to look at the CT angiogram. We're fortunate here that we have radiology registrars, but in services, out of our services, some of these hospitals is a little bit more difficult, um, especially with radiology. 
So all of these places, especially to the north of our area and to the north um, east of our area, is a challenge because there is nowhere else for them to go for thrombectomy. Some of these could quite reasonably go down to London, um, but the, the others um, have difficulty accessing thrombectomy. Um, so we obviously need to provide thrombectomy. We need to think about all of the, the resources we need. And what's been going on over the past um, few years is a lot of work in the background in terms of business cases and design and recruitment and so on. Um, in 2022, after a few meetings, quite, quite, quite a few meetings, uh, we agreed the staffing and the building work would be um, funded through a business case, big business case, um, in, in, um, you know, in reaching almost 10 million pounds for this business case. Um, we've uh, agreed on the, the staffing in terms of radiographers, nurses, stroke team, which includes their nurses, stroke consultants, juniors, anaesthetic team, including consultants, juniors, ODPs, uh, recovery staff. Um, all of that has been put into place. We've recruited a further two interventional neuroradiologists. Um, and actually we're building, uh, or we're almost built, we're gonna get it next week, a second uh, neuroangio suite to give us the additional capacity. So that when patients come with stroke, we can, go, we can actually treat them. We have space um, to, to treat these cases and also space for additional staff to work. You can't just employ staff and not have somewhere uh, uh, for them to work. If you get a chance, um, probably from next week onwards, this is the room that's been built. Uh, it's a second angio suite, it's a biplane. Um, it doesn't look finished, um, but I, I'm kind of imagining that, you know, when you see these TV programs where they go and they say, we'll sort out somebody's garden and they'll kind of, and everything is just coming at last minute and they say, here it is, and you have this perfectly presented um, thing. So this, this, is, this is going to be tidied up and on Monday, on Monday the uh, 27th, we're actually going to be handed it over. The, 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 um, the team that's, uh, so it's a Siemens machine, so they're going to come in and do a couple of days work on it. And then from Wednesday on, they're going to start teaching us how to use the machine. And we should be doing live cases there very shortly. This was a big expense. Um, <clears throat> the expense was not just to, of course, in terms of the money, but in terms of finding the space in radiology, which is, you know, we're quite sort of landlocked here. And we say, so you want to have this space, then we have to move that to somewhere else, which has to move something else to somewhere else. Uh, consultant offices were sacrificed in this process. Um, and I do apologize to my colleagues um, uh, for in advance of that. And it's, it's a, it is a bit of a sore point, but we've, we do need um, the space. And, and can I interrupt there? So, and we also had to be key to the rooms for level four, yep, which yep. meant that medicine had to move into the uh, New Heart and Lung Institute, surgery moves into the L6 and space that the medicine vacated. Um, the L4 corridor, which is optimized for orthopedics, then move back up to orthopedics. So I mean, it's a huge yeah, yeah. jigsaw of moves and things. Which is and it was it was it, people to, to build this. It's very challenging to actually do do all of that negotiating as well, if exactly. you imagine. So, um, so what we we've done with the service is we've opened to five day referrals uh, on the 9th of May, and we did that in anticipation that the business case has been passed. So let's get the service going. Um, once that had, had uh, uh, bedded in, um, we increased to a six-day service from just January this year, 14th of January. Um, we, what facilitated that was actually we employed more diagnostic neuroradiologists to allow us interventional neuroradiologists to come off that rotor. Um, and so now we'd run a separate, uh, at the moment, one in three um, Saturday rotor. Um, and of course, the, the stroke team needed more junior staff, so they've had nurses and so on, but they wanted especially a junior tier, a new junior tier to, uh, to be able to support this service, so they've put that in as well. Our next step is going to be a seven-day extended hour service, so as I said, we've appointed two consultants, they haven't started yet, they plan, they're probably August, September before we get them started, um, and then we'll go for seven days, extended hours. And then the final step, which is looking distant and remote at this stage, is that we have to set up another thrombectomy service with another biplane in Norfolk and Norwich, um, which has is, is been identified by um, NHS England in their infinite wisdom, to have a, a, um, an interventional centre there that can do thrombectomy um, and uh, working with us so that we can support each other at nights as well. So that gives five people doing 24-7 with 
probably be a challenge. Um, it definitely would be a challenge, but having that shared out is, is what, what the plan is. So we want to keep it in a sustainable kind of um, development. So that's our uh, plans going forward. In terms of cases per year, this is what we've what we've done. We had a bit of a slump, as you can see, in 2020, uh, with something of a lockdown. And although we were always around and available to do these cases, for some reason, the referrals went down. Um, and um, there was, uh, I think the, the whole system seemed to clog up a little bit, but we're coming out of that. And 2022, um, we did 41 cases. Um, the 23, up to date, we've done 13 cases. And actually the 14th is being done just now, um, as I walked up, they were putting the patient onto the table. So 14 cases, and so it's comparable to what we were doing in 2016, just in the first two months of this year. So we're really ramping up the service if you look at what from that sort of um, annual perspective. So lots is, uh, lots is going on, the, uh, the service is ramping up. I think the, with, with about 14 in this, these two months, we should be hitting six times that then by the end of the year we'll have seven day services going soon so probably about 100 maybe this year and it's just the uh, the sky seems to be the limit at the moment and talking about that then so what what can we do in terms of okay that's the the, the core work but is there more we can do to expand indications and there's a lot of work going on because people um we, we're, we're not um say at the forefront of this we we are catching up and as we, as soon as we develop one service, there's a um, uh, an, an, an increase in, in the evidence, in the knowledge, and actually we can do more. So the first thing is time window. So the six hours is a bit of a pain because when you have a stroke, um, it's not like a like an MI. In the when when people have an MI, they seem to kind of you know it's, it's a you have a feeling of impending doom. And you want to go to hospital and you want to get this sorted out with a stroke it's just well my arm's not working maybe i can sleep it off and there is that kind of impression within within stroke so that's why the public education is really important um, but there's something naturally uh, different about, about about our service so for um time windows what we want to try and do is is try and work out is there a difference between the amount of brain damage, the amount of brain that potentially could be saved, and perfusion has been our tool for this. Now, this is a very Cambridge thing. We, a lot of the early work in in, um, in perfusion was actually done in Cambridge, not not using CT. Um, but the penumbra concept, um, just to kind of quickly go over that, if you have the, just a cartoon, just to show you what 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 we mean by penumbra. Um, this is a brain, this is a blood vessel going into the brain, and that vessel is then occluded. So what happens is as part of that brain becomes hyperperfused. It's not half, because what happens is that the other, other half of the brain starts to kind of try to, re try to capture that area. But a significant proportion, if it's a large vessel, will become hypoperfused. And within that, centrally, part of that brain will start to die. The, the most hyperperfused brain will, will start to die. And that's what we call the core infarct. And this is what we call the penumbra. So we can use CT perfusion or other perfusion technologies to try and work out what the difference is between those two. We don't know exactly. And so, so we, we, we'll take this to the clinical level in a second, to try and work out how, how to select patients. If we don't do anything, so if we, if we start from this position, we don't do anything, we think that the penumbra, and we know actually that the penumbra will become the core infarct, the infarct will expand, and that all of that brain will, will become damaged. And if we treat successfully, then we can re-perfuse re, re the rest of the brain, and you're left with that small infarct, like the CT perfusion I just showed you in the case earlier. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is the aim, this is what we're trying to do, is open up that blood vessel, arrest the progress of the infarct, and be left with um, a uh, the rest of the brain being perfused, left with a small core infarct. So clinical trials using this were developed to try to show, can we do, can we extend the thrombectal window, do a perfusion, show this brain to save, and then um, uh, uh, compare those against patients that had not been treated. So this was the trial. This was published in late 2017. It was, a, it was quite a landmark trial. Um, what they did was they took patients beyond six hours and up to 24 hours, 
And when you get to 24 hours, you think, well, you know, is there any time window at all? You know, 24 hours is so far from the onset of stroke. You expect most people would have come in by then. And what they found was that they found a 73% reduction in dependency and a number needed to treat of two. So actually it was, a, it was, it was quite, a, quite a surprise. This, this treatment effect was even greater than the patients that were having uh, within the six hour window. Um, what they had to do, they had to do a CT perfusion. They used automated software to assess that perfusion and calculate the, the size of the core. And they used um, clinical symptoms just to say how bad the stroke was. And it was, it was like a scale of, um, I'll show you that in a second. And then they, uh, the scale they used was that if you were over 80, you were allowed to have a stroke, if you had a stroke worse than 10. So like, as I said, uh, you know, minor stroke is two, four, anything over six is eligible for a thrombectomy. Uh, 20, 30, the scale goes up to like 42, but the, you know, anything over six is considered the major stroke. So you had to have a stroke over 10 and a relatively small infarct volume. If you had that, then you went into the trial and you had, had if you were less than 80, you were a bit more flexible, you were allowed to have a larger infarct. And if you were less than 80 and you had a really bad stroke, you were allowed an even bigger infarct. So these are the people that went into the, the trial. Um, they did, they had bad strokes. They had um, times, there were 12 hours, 13 hours on average that were, um, that they were randomizing these patients and having thrombectomy. And it did show a positive effect. And the, the key things were functional independence. That's the one figure we really like to see the headline. Is this patient come back to independence? 50% almost uh, with the thrombectomy arm were independent. And if you left them, only 13% were independent. So definitely when you find these criteria, you think, well, we should be treating these patients. And um, it generally 13.6 hours to get. So the artery has been blocked for that long and you can reperfuse and you can get a good outcome um, if, um, for, you know, make, make people independent. So um, just those figures in a, a bit in a different kind of presentation to say, well, every two patients who had a thrombectomy, one of them, one additional one had a better score for disability, so less disabled. And there's a, there's a score for disability, we have a, a zero, so the, the modified ranking scale, a zero is no disability, one is a disability, but does it affect daily living, two is a disability which affects daily living, but doesn't affect independence, and then three is it affects your independence, but you can get around, and it goes on until six, which you're dead. Um, so you move across that scale. And for every 2.8 patients that you're treated, that were treated, one had a functional independence at 90 days. So a number needed to treat to make someone independent of 2.8. I'll come back to that in a, in a second. This trial was done, of course, then you need the confirmatory trial. There was another trial going on at the same time called Diffuse 3, which was published just a couple of months after the, uh, the Dawn trial. It was a US trial. They treated six to 16 hours. They did a bit more perfusion-based imaging. They looked at the penumbra as imaging criteria rather than just as a um, clinical criteria. And they also found that they, there was a shift of this modified ranking scale. So the scale I just described to you, you see that we're, if you're moving in this direction, moving uh, sorry, away from this, these, these figures are ex expanding. So you want to see more people in the zero and the one and the two. You want to see less people dying. And you want actually, you'd want this figures to stay kind of more or less the same because you don't want to keep people with severe disability you know if, if you've converted someone from dying and just made them into well, someone who's severely disabled in a nursing home not able to do anything that's considered an undesirable outcome um, but the, this, this this is the shifts that we we see there was no difference in bleeding we all thought that if we if we did a delayed thrombectomy there would be a massive hemorrhage in the brain that wasn't shown in the study and the the treatment effect as i said earlier was better than patients in the six hour window so uh, important treatment. Time to reflect though, that there's probably a problem with this in that, yes, stroke thrombectomy, number needed to treat 2.8, definitely we should do it. But if you have a treatment effect like that, then you're probably over-selecting patients and that you're probably not giving the treatment to as many people as you ought to be. So just to give you an example of NNTs, um, so we like to compare ourselves with early invasive strategy for, you know, so PCI, for uh, coronary um, uh, artery disease, for um, coronary, uh, myocardial infarction. 
uh, lots of investment in that, lots of work going on, you know, lots of people going in. Um, but actually, if you look at the MNTs there, um, in terms of death, there's there's no no difference. In terms of feeling less chest pain, you have to do nine for, for one person. If you avoid a heart attack next year, this is one in 50. Um, so there's actually, uh, and there's, these are the harms. So just when you're, when you're talking these kind of figures, you do feel that actually we've probably over-selected patients. We should be doing procedures with an NNT of 10 rather than selecting patients to do an NNT of 2.8. So there's something to be, to be done to relax these guidelines. So what's happened, and this has happened really very recently, um, is some, there's been a, a few very well-organized trials that published simultaneously and presented in a conference on the 10th of February, just this month. So this is being digested by the neurointerventional community. But what they found was they took patients with large core infarcts with a, with a thrombex, with a large vessel occlusion. So, so normally the patients we would reject and say, well, this is too much brain damage. We can't do anything with this one. And they did a thrombectomy on them. They randomized them to medical treatment or thrombectomy and see, is there a difference? There was, they, they treated um, patients, and there was one trial that was exclusively Chinese, because um, they, they get very large trials these days in stroke. And the other one was from US, Canada, Europe, no UK, but you know, we're kind of between US and Europe, so we can count that as, as probably similar to our population. Um, treated, they treated patients with large vessel occlusion. They allowed that large ischemic core, I'll explain to you what that, what that means, just, just for our clarity. And they treated patients up to 24 hours. So the aspect score, when you, when you look at a brain that's you know, where the MCA is blocked, like the, the case I showed you, um, the aspect score is becoming um, increasingly important in trying to work out how much damage is there to the brain. So you, you divide the, the, the cortical areas into three um, on, on two levels. One is the level above the basal ganglia. This is the level of the basal ganglia. In the basal ganglia, you have four areas. So you have a total of 10 areas. And when any of those are damaged, you say that, so you lose a, a, a point on the aspect scale. So someone who's aspect three, which is what they're saying, may have maybe one, two, three areas uh, surviving and everything else is damaged. The basal ganglia is often the ones that go first because they're, they're more sensitive. Um, so you may lose all of this, you may lose all of this and just have some distal cortical areas that are um, alive. Uh, not damaged, and those are the patients that they're selecting for these trials. And they showed a good treatment effect. Um, so even when there was a large area of brain that looked damaged, um, they did the thrombectomy, and they had people that were independent, small number of people that were no disability, but they had people that were independent um, and I think it's hard to show on this scale, but this is the medical arm. You see the, the shifts are going in the right direction, going towards the, the right side. Um, so there was uh, a age, about normal for stroke patients. They randomized them in about nine and a half hours. There was the aspect score of four, which was median. So these were, they were all gonna be low aspect scores. The, if, they, if you measured volume, then it was 80 mils, which is bigger than any of the trials before. And 20% of the patients in the thrombectomy group were independent versus 7% that were in the medical care group. So there's a treatment effect, even with low aspect score, high damage in the brain, um, which is something that we did not expect. And we have been routinely excluding these patients from treatment. So what does that mean? Does it mean that we can now just dispose of all that interesting complex imaging that we have CT perfusion to select patient thrombectomy. Can we actually just relax our time windows and say, look, it doesn't matter, eight hours, nine hours, 12 hours, let's just get them in if they've got an artery occlusion. We're still digesting this information. And it's worth us kind of thinking about this, pulling this trial to bits, but it does seem to be a high quality piece of work. And it looks like the direction that we will be heading into. And the last thing I just want to go over is which vessels should we open? Because at the moment, what we do is we take our catheter, and this is the ICA, uh, this is the anterior cerebral artery, and this is the middle cerebral artery, then that divides into M2 branches. And we say ICA, M1, fine, 
proximal M2 will go into. But beyond that, we stop and we don't, we say, well, that's probably a bit too distal. What I will do is I will straighten up these somewhat flexible vessels. I may perforate something and I shouldn't really, you know, and you actually see that happening when you're doing an angiogram and you pull the clot, you see the whole vessel straighten and it's, 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 it's an unsettling feeling sometimes. So if you, if you see that, you, 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 don't, you know, and, you, and you, you, some, you do the CT scan the next day, you do see some small amount of subarachnoid hemorrhage. And if you're unlucky, you see a large amount of subarachnoid hemorrhage. So you, you want to be very careful with these procedures as well. But what we're not certain is where should we go? How far should we go? So there's actually a trial um, of MEVOs. So I've talked about large vessel occlusion. These are medium vessel occlusions, saying, what if we go and treat those? So what, the, what we're going to do, and we're actually part of this clinical trial at the moment, uh, we haven't yet recruited our first patient, but we're, we're on the case, um, is someone who will have an acute stroke, they will, they'll be within 12 hours, um, they have to have a, a proper stroke, so a six or, a, um, or above, and it's just more than five, or a disabling stroke, if, if, if it's uh, in the judgment of the stroke team, identify a MEVO and see if we can open that up and see if that will um, have the desired effect. Um, we are one of, the, we are one of the countries that are taking, well, you know, us and a few other centers in the UK, as well as mostly UK, uh, USA, Canada, and a few in Germany as well. Um, there is actually genuine equipoise about whether or not we should do that. Um, there's the benefit of seeing, well, thrombectomy works so well in large vessel occlusions, why would it not work in medium? Plus, when we see that vessel straighten up, we feel a bit. So there's new devices, new technology that's come out. They've made smaller thrombectomy devices for us to use. And we should be able to get an answer from this. So to conclude, um, it's, 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 it's a journey. And we're continuing along this journey to deliver thrombectomy to, um, to patients. It's really needed a lot of um, expansion, uh, disturbance to not just um, you know, neuroradiology and intervention, but to the whole department, um, to the whole hospital in terms of what, all the things that we've, we've asked for and that we've needed. Um, there's been all of that passed, the recruitment is there. Um, there is, now that we've got to the stage where we thought we could get, to, we needed to get to, the goalposts are shifting as they do towards more and more uh, of this work, the time window, the patient population, the vessel size. And it seems that as soon as we've get the room next week, we're going to be thinking about how do we expand up our service even more and continue to expand up so that we may be working on a business case proposal again. Um, thank you very much for your kind attention. Um, if you have any questions or comments, I'd be very happy to take those.